Hey everybody, welcome back to the Behaviour Revolution Scriptures. It's a bright, rainy Monday morning today. and We're approaching the uh, season of Passover in a few days. This Thursday is the uh, Feast of Passover. So we've got a few things to talk about today. And uh, it's very exciting. I just want to go into an article that just came up on Facebook just as I was about to record this. So we're going to go into it because it kind of covers everything. And I found it really fascinating. It's about apprehension are you apprehensive about stuff i mean there's a lot of fresh things that you should bring out amongst the bride are you apprehensive are you nervous to go into things to explore things to change come out of shadows and things like that let's have a look apprehension what does apprehension mean Anxiety or fear that something bad or unpleasant will happen. He felt sick with apprehension. So anxiety or fear that something bad or unpleasant will happen. Apprehensive, you know. Terry has a good explanation of how to avoid apprehension. James 4, 17. To him then, who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. To him then, who does... Who knows to do good and does not do it? To him it's sin. Many people hold themselves back and don't move on or grow in their lives. Hold themselves back, don't move on or grow in their lives because of apprehension. Instead, they lock themselves up inwardly and can't perform their daily duties. Our first sister, Kua, displayed ap apprehended unbelief, apprehended unbelief and confusion when confronted by the craftiness, craftiest beast Yahuwah Elohim had made. So when she was confronted by the craftiest beast Yahuwah Elohim had ever made, she displayed apprehended unbelief. This beast deceived our sister with straight out lies going against the instructions of Yahuwah. Kuah showed apprehension and brought upon herself and her husband a curse upon the land. They could no longer eat of the fruit of the tree of eternal life they would have to toil for their food, eating the plants of the field and bread. Apprehension brings curses upon men and women who refuse to follow the instructions for men on how to live successfully on this earth. How to live successfully on this earth. Apprehension is a wicked behaviour and needs to be stopped in the bride. We can't do anything about the behaviour of this world, but we do know that amongst the bride, apprehension is sin. If we refuse to change and use this behavior on others because of our disobedience to the word, we'll, we will end up as dust. Apprehension. Afraid. What was apprehension again? Let's go back up there. Apprehension. Anxiety or fear. Afraid. Afraid to, to step out into the unknown. Afraid. We've been talking, like I said, we're coming into Passover. We've been talking a lot about change. Changes that people aren't comfortable to make because people want to stay comfortable in the shadows, in the liturgies, because we feel safe in them, like a warm blanket. If we do this, 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 and this, we've done the right thing and we can go home, or if we're at home, we can be happy that we did the feast properly instead of stepping out of all that into the unknown. You know, how many people want to step out of their assembly, step out of their church, step out of the movement that they're in because they don't feel things are quite right, they're apprehensive, afraid. If I come out from under this covering, if I come out from under this banner, I'll be all alone. There'll be no one to teach me. Who should promise us to teach you by his Ruach, through his word? It's, it's a religious mindset hangover that you need other people to teach you stuff. Particularly in this day and age where you can click a button on YouTube and watch all sorts of mad things, good and bad. You know, it's not hard to fill yourself with knowledge these days. But can you come out of all that and enter into the instructions given to mankind to live by? Let's go on. Very interesting, all this. Today, in our chapter in uh, the Midbar or Numbers, we, we finished with all the censuses, sensei, censuses, and uh, we're coming into the offerings of dedication. We're still at the, uh, you know, tabernacle being finished. It's just been finished, and we're still here. 
on the day that the tabernacle was finished. Musha anointed it along with all its furnishings, altars and utensils, setting it all apart for Yahusha. Then all the tribal leaders of Yisrael who had registered all the troops for battle came and brought their offerings. Together they brought six large wagons. Pay attention to this because this is one of the longest. Pay attention to this because this was one of the longest, not the longest, but one of the longest chapters in scripture. It went for about 90 verses. Now you'd have about 10 lines of the exact same thing with a couple of names changed. This tribe brought all this stuff. And then this tribe brought all this stuff. But it was all the same stuff. So I've listed it once for you here. So you can see what all of them brought. And then we've done a little chart. So all the tribal leaders brought these offerings together. Together they brought six large wagons and 12 oxen. A wagon for every two leaders and an ox for each leader. And they presented these to Yahushua in front of the tabernacle. So Yahushua said to Musha, Receive these, these gifts of oxen and wagons today and distribute them among the Luites according to the work they have to do in transporting the tabernacle. So they built the tabernacle and now they have to work out how to transport it from A to B. So all the tribes are bringing donations. So Musha took the wagons and oxen and presented them to the Luites, giving two wagons and four oxen to the Gerashonite clan. Then four wagons and eight oxen to the Merarite clan for their work under the leadership of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the high priest. But he gave none of the wagons or oxen to the Keathite clan because they had to carry the set-apart objects of the tabernacle on their shoulders. So this was the most set-apart uh, of the tribes of Louis, but they weren't given any supplies because they were to carry the actual ark on their shoulders. The tribal leaders. The tribal leaders also placed dedication gifts before the altar at the time it was anointed. And Yahushua said to Musha, let one tribe, one, let one tribal leader bring his gift each day for the dedication of my altar. Musha, uh, Yahushua said to Musha, let one tribal leader bring his gift each day, one gift per day. So 12 tribes, 12 days for the dedication of my altar. So for the next 12 days, a tribal leader presented this gift on behalf of their tribe. This is what they brought. 1.5 kilos, silver platter and silver basin, both filled with grain offerings of choice, moistened flour with olive oil. A 114 gram gold container filled with incense, a young bull, a ram and a one year old male lamb for an ascending the offering. A male goat for a purifying offering and two bulls, five rams, five male goats and five one year old male lambs for an intimate peace offering a tribe presented each day so that whole paragraph there was listed 12 times with these guys names changed so it said from the tribe of Yehuda Abinadab and his leader Nazaran brought forth all these things here and it mentioned it 12 times plus another time in so I've just broken 70 as it says there in the white here I've just broken 75 verses of scripture into one neat little chart. You're welcome. So we can see that those are the 12 tribes. That was the, the family, the clans that were like, because these guys here weren't alive anymore. These are just the tribal names. These are the family names. And this was the actual leader at the time who brought, presented the offering to the whites. So interesting that the tribe of Yehuda went first because this is the tribe that Yehusha came from and interesting that if they are all bringing forth an offering each day in the start of the beginning of the week which most people agree it did then on the seventh day which was a Shabbat we have the tribe of Ephraim here anyway let's go on a little bit further Everything that occurs here started on the first day of the first month of the second year after Yisrael left Egypt and ended on the 20th day of the second month of the second year. So we're talking about a short 50 day period. That's the point there. We're talking about a short 50 day period. The construction of the tabernacle was completed on the first day of the first month of the second year also. And the census of Yisrael and the Luwites occurred during this time also, as well as Yisrael moving from Mount Sinai when the cloud moved. This has all happened within a 50 day period. The Merari clan was given four wagons compared to the clans of Gershon, 
who received only two wagons because the Marorites were assigned to carry the huge and heavy wooden planks that supported the tabernacle. Whereas the Gershonites only had to transport the curtains that were hung at the entrance leading to the tent. Now what's interesting is that the Keathites, one of the highest ranking of the clans, didn't receive any wagons because they had to carry the most set apart and precious Ark of the Blood Covenant Witness. There it is there. This was interesting. They had to carry it on their shoulders. And there's all sorts of scriptures you can look up and studies you can do about bearing, bearing the esteem on the shoulders of the priesthood, all that sort of thing. You can go into that if you want. The Ark of the Blood Covenant Witness was to be carried on the shoulders of the clan of Kiath, using the long poles that were inserted into the rings attached to the four corners of the tabernacle. It was not to be placed in a wagon or cart for transportation. That's why Musha didn't give them any carts, that, that clan. Gave the carts to the other clans for carrying all the other wooden beams and all sorts of things. But not this, not these guys. They had to carry it on their shoulders. See the picture? We will see later on that Yushua's leadership under King Daoud ignored this particular detail and paid the dire consequences. That's the right way. Tick. Down here, we have a cross. Don't go. They put it on an oxen cart. Yisrael had violated the instruction to have the ark transported on the shoulders of the Luites instead of transporting it via a cart, and the results were disastrous. When the ark was about to fall off the wagon, a man named Uzzah spontaneously reached out his hand to steady it and was killed instantly by Yahushua, who was absolutely furious at Uzzah's disobedience. So we read that and go, that's a bit harsh. He's just trying to stop your set-apart property from falling on the ground. Your, you know, we didn't want your ark to break. And now you've killed him. Bit unfair, isn't it, Yahushua? But what do we learn? Not only, this was a double whammy. Not only was the ark being transported on a cart and not the shoulders of the Luites, but it was not allowed to be touched either. So it was double. It is believed that this double whammy of disobedience was why Yahushua's anger was intensified to a degree rarely seen. Has Yahushua changed? Does he still require obedience to his instructions? This was his set apart property and he'd given specific instructions to Musha to give to the priesthood on how to transport his special, his, it's mine. You courier the way I tell you, you know, not your way, my way or else. And look what they've done. Later on under the rule of King David, I'll oh, just chuck it on a cart, we'll, we'll, it's safer, we'll do it that way. It's too, too much, too, too far. I don't want to carry all that, that's too heavy, you know. And look what happened. So, does Yahushua change? Does he still require obedience to his instructions? Are you going for obedience to his instructions? Are you seeking to please him in that way? Looking for the fresh word, looking for his fresh movements every day, what he's going to do, looking for the play, what's going on, or are you apprehensive to step into the unknown? Are you nervous and afraid? Look how he feels. He struck someone dead. A living being that he created, he struck dead because of this. So there's a right way, tick, and there's a wrong way. And of course, the Keathite clan had to carry the Ark of the Blood Covenant Witness on their shoulders. Transporting the weight of his esteem. Does that ring true to us? On the shoulders of the priests. What today does that mean to us? We're kings and priests that house the esteem of Yahushua. And that responsibility falls on our shoulders to carry his esteem around with us. Not just slap happy, you know, behave how we want, take our life into our own hands, do it our way. He's got specific instructions for how this carcass, this ruach filled dwelling place must behave. What about our last episode about the three, the golden rules are a summary of all the scriptures combined. You know, are you even interested? 
in pleasing Yahushua through your behaviour? Whenever Musha went into the tabernacle to speak with Yahushua, he heard the voice of the Creator speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the ark's cover, the lid of atonement that rests on the ark of the blood covenant witness. Yahushua spoke to him from there. And the Hebrew word being used in the above scripture implies to converse with somebody. In other words, one party says something and the other party responds back. So Musha is not simply receiving instructions from Yahushua here. He was actually having a two-way conversation with him. This is awesome. There have been precious few men in history who have had the incredible privilege and honour to be able to engage in a two-way dialogue with the creator of the universe. Even though he wasn't standing inside the most set-apart place from here on out, we know he had a very open relationship with Yahushua and was one of the very few permitted into the esteem of Yahushua. So once the tabernacle has been constructed and finished and anointed and the esteem's fallen, Musha doesn't go in, into the ark either at this point. Only one man goes in one day a year on the Day of Atonement. So many people have tried to use that, and it's written here. Many have tried to use this text to declare that believers today are not permitted, no, no, not permitted into the most set-apart place, but only the set-apart place. But this is not true. As Yahushua rent the veil with his own shed blood and broken body, opening little portals within each member of his bride, allowing the direct access to his throne. So many have said that, oh, we can only come to the Father through Yahushua, and you know, you can't go into the through the veil into the presence of you. You've got to go through Yahushua. And also, yes, that's true. We do have to go through Yahushua, but Yahushua is the Father as well, the Father and the Son. And we have open shamayim, open portal doorway within us now. So we actually do have direct access. We can go through the veil into his presence now. His presence is is within us when his rent flesh on the stake his esteem went forth 50 days later it filled his emissaries so this was a little interesting charted it up because you may not think it's true but i thought it was very fascinating yehuda and aphram were prophesied to be dominant by these offerings remember up there when i showed you the chart on the first day I mean, many believe, I've written it right here, look. Many believe that the first tribal offering was made on the first day of the week, which would mean that Ephraim presented their offering on the Shabbat. Both of the soon-to-be dominant tribes gave their offerings at the beginning and end of the same week. Coincidence or prophecy? So uh, there were 12 tribes, 12 offerings. The first tribe to step forward was Yehuda, first tribe to make an offering. And most commentaries, scholars, rabbis, all those people believe that it was on the first day of the week. Where they get that from, I don't know. Is it true? I don't know. But I'm putting it here so you can think about it. It's an interesting gem. So if it was the first day of the week that Yehuda presented their offering, when you go down the list, and there were 12 of them, on day number seven, which was a Shabbat, end of the week, Ephraim. Just interesting that out of all the 12 tribes, Yehuda and Ephraim presented their offerings at the beginning and the end of the week. And that's all I have to say about it. Coincidence or prophecy? Because those are the two tribes. They're the two dominant tribes. The two sticks that will become one. The older brother and the younger brother. The two, I think it was two tribes of Yehuda and the ten northern tribes, you know, of Ephraim. Of course, they're all scattered now. Even, the, even those who've come forward and uh, from the Jewish, Jewish, are still most of them are still scattered as well. So we're waiting for what Yahushua is going to do, not some religious movement. So let's go into the next one. They had to prepare the seven lamps. Preparing the seven lamps, uh, and in Hebrew, this is a menorah. So Yahushua said to Musha, "Give Aaron the following instructions: When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstand, place them." so that their light shines forward in front of the lampstand. So their light shines forward. These aren't candles. These are little miniature oil lamps, seven of them. And you could face them in different directions to shine the light wherever you want. Like little spotlights. So Yahushua's instructed that they be shining forward in front of the lampstand. Why? 
Anyway, you, uh, Aaron set up the seven lamps so they reflected their light forward just as Yahushua had instructed Musha and the entire lampstand from its base to its decorative blossoms was made of beaten gold and built according to the exact design Yahushua had shown Musha. The priests had to tend to both the brazen altar and the lampstand twice a day to ensure the fire in both of these set apart objects kept burning. However, unlike the brazen altar, which was kept burning 24 seven, the lampstand only burnt during the night time. Interesting. And let's look at the word light. The Hebrew word for light used here is not planetary light, i.e. sun, moon or stars. I mean, they were actually lighting physical flames, you know, in the, gold, in the oil lamps. They were lighting actual lights, yes. But Yahushua, that it wasn't talking about that kind of, the Hebrew word was not talking about that kind of light. It's uh, not planetary light, but Yahushua set apart a steam, just as he declared in the beginning of Barashi. Let light appear, let there be light. You know, that wasn't the day he created the sun. So it wasn't talking about physical light, it was talking about his esteem. So the set-apart lampstand represented Yahushua's set-apart light, and the priests were able to direct the light from the seven oil lamps in whatever direction they chose. And Yahushua instructed that the light instructed the light to face forward. Now, given look at the picture over here, what is forward? The light had to face forward, and what's right in front of the lampstand? The table of showbread with six pieces of bread on this side and six loaves of bread on that side, yeah? Which was six and six, but the tribes, the 12 tribes. So now given that the 12 loaves of showbread symbolized the 12 tribes of Israel and the light was shining forward upon it, we have a picture of Yahushua's esteem shining upon an obedient Israel, bringing blessings and favor and shalom. Isn't that what we go into the, but we are, if you've woken up to, to Yahushua, the name of Yahushua being immersed and grafting into the commonwealth of Yisrael, you are one of the lost tribes of Yisrael. You know? There's no difference between the Jew or the Gentile when you, in this new restored bride, this bridal company, you are a tribe of Yisrael. A son and a daughter. One of the lost sheep. So, what does it say to us about going into that portal which is Yahushua, the light, and filling ourselves with him, not just through his written word, but through his voice, through communicating with him, through hearing him doing what he says to do in your day, finding him, you know, stepping back, doing the rules, stepping back, letting people have it. Don't take what they say personally. Don't make excuses. Doing, having this experience with Yahushua. This is the bridal experience. Are you having it? Because look, this is just another shadow. But it's interesting to study the shadows. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, poo-pooing any of the shadows. I'm poo-pooing behaving them all dot and line by line and exactly today because they've been fulfilled. But the shadows are still Yahushua's work. We still read them and learn from them, you know. And this is a shadow that the candlestick had to, uh, the lampstand had to shine forward upon the bride, Yeshua. Fascinating when you look at these. This is why I'm loving these patterns, these shadows, because it shows us today who you are, who I am, who we are today. We are the bride. And finally, we come to the Luites being dedicated. Now, this wasn't the tribe of, uh, sorry, this wasn't uh, the priests, because they had already been inaugurated. They'd already been established. These, these are the Luites. These aren't Aaron's sons. These are the Luites. The, the rest of the, the rest of the tribe, the Luites had been separated into Aaron. The Luites had been separated into Aaron's sons, the priests, and the rest. So, after he set apart the tribe of Lui, separated them from the rest of Israel, they were no longer a tribe from here on out. They were no longer counted as a tribe of Israel. Now he separated them again into Aaron's sons the actual priests who could go into the set apart place and then there were the other well, the other three tribes the Merorite, the Keathite and the Gershonite clans and they were all to serve the tabernacle so 
Yerusha said to Musha, Now set the Levites apart from the rest of the people of Israel and make them ceremonially clean by sprinkling them with the living water of purification. And have them cut their hair off short and wash their clothes. Now, the original says, take a razor and shave their heads. Well, that was uh, shaving your skin down to uh, the flesh wasn't the Hebrew way. So you've got to understand the context of what that uh, Hebrew idiom is. They weren't talking about taking a razor and shaving it down to actual flesh. Um, you, you can do that these days if you want, that's irrelevant. But I'm talking about here, they didn't actually go and shave their heads like monks. It just meant if they're all out kicking around in the wilderness with all this long hair, you know, make yourselves clean. Go and get a haircut. Cut it all short, you know? That's what it meant. So I've made it easy here. Go and have a haircut and wash your clothes. Included in that idea of washing clothes, they were also to bathe in water, full immersion in a river or stream as the last step to transition from an unclean to clean state. We've dealt with that many times now. Immersion being ceremonially washed to take one from a state of unclean to clean, whether they touched a dead animal or whether they had a sickness, ritual washing, all right? Then they'll be ceremonially clean. Have them bring a young bull and a love, as have them bring a young bull and a love grain offering of choice flour moistened with olive oil, along with a second young bull for a purifying offering. Then assemble the whole community of Israel and present the Luwite performing at the entrance of the tabernacle. And the people of Israel must lay their hands on them. That's a lot of people. Two to three million people? No. This doesn't mean the whole population of around two to three million people laid their hands on them. It was just the elders who served as representatives for the people who laid their hands on the Luwites. So after that, and raising his hands, Aaron must then present the Luwites to me as a special offering from the people of Israel, dedicating them to my service. Next, the Luwites will lay their hands on the heads of young bulls. So Israel's just laid their hands on the Luwites, and now the Luwites are laying their hands on the heads of young bulls. Remember, laying the hands on somebody is substituting, putting the blame, putting the, you know, doing something here. Let's have a look. Luwites will lay their hands on the head of the young bulls, presenting one as a purifying offering and the other as an ascending the offering to me to purify the Luwites and make them right with me. Then have them stand in front of Aaron and his sons and raise your hands and present them a special offering to me. In this way, you will set the Luwites apart from the rest of the people of Israel and the Luwites will officially belong to me. Then after this, they may go into the tabernacle to do their work. But you have purified them and presented them as a special offering. This procedure of the Israelites being substituted by the Luwites who are in turn substituted by the bulls, is a precise picture of how Yahushua's justice system works. Innocent blood had to be shed for direct access. What does that mean? We're gonna go into that a little bit. So, from this day on, the Luites are set apart. They're not considered a tribe of Yisrael anymore. Out of the people of Yisrael, out of the people of Yisrael, the Luites are reserved for me. I have claimed them for myself in place of all the firstborn sons of Israel as a substitute. We talked about that substitute a few episodes ago. For all the firstborn males among the people of Israel were mine, both the people and animals. I set them apart for myself on the day I struck down all the firstborn sons of Egyptians. So yes, I have claimed the Luites in place of all the firstborn sons of Israel. And of all Israel, I have assigned the Luites to Aaron and his sons to serve in the tabernacle on behalf of Israel and make sacrifices to purify the people so that no plague will strike them when they approach the sanctuary. We are shown over and over again that when somebody disobeys Yahushua's instructions, his evil behavior must be paid for by an innocent party if he is to be forgiven. Which is why in the sacrificial system, an innocent animal is slaughtered for what the scripture terms unintentional crimes. And for high-handed, intentional crimes, such as murder or adultery, the criminal pays for his disobedience with his very own life. Yahushua's set apartness is, is so pure that he cannot let even one disobedient behaviour slide without his set apartness being compromised. And this is also the reason why, after even killing an animal for food, it is forbidden to drink its blood. The blood of the animal must be returned to Yahushua as a ransom payment for it being killed by a human. 
Remember the very life force of every creature is in its blood. Every life force that is cut off, every death must be accounted for. I'm gonna go into this in a little bit more in the next paragraph, but keep that in mind, the whole idea of substitution. It's like Yahushua's bookkeeping. Every number had, to, every sum had to add up. Every transaction had to add up. Every life meant something because there was blood pumping through its veins, person or animal. So, and remember in the beginning, he said, if you disobey me, you will die. Disobedience equals death. So if somebody disobeys, it had to be a death, you know? So technically everybody should be dead. Anyway, Musha, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel dedicated the Luites, carefully following all Yahushua's instructions, carefully. The Luites purified themselves from their disobedience and washed their clothes, and Aaron lifted them up and presented them to Yahushua as a special offering. Then he offered a sacrifice to purify them and make them right with, with Yahushua, and after that, the Luites went into the tabernacle to perform their duties, assisting Aaron and his sons. So they carried out all the instructions that Yahushua gave Musha concerning the Luites. Yahushua also instructed Musha, this is the rule that the Luites must follow. They must begin serving in the tabernacle at the age of 25 and they must retire at the age of 50. And after retirement, they must assist their fellow Luites by serving as guards at the tabernacle. But they may not officiate in the service. This is how you must assign duties to them. So even when they retired from the actual hard labor of it, they weren't just to sit down and do nothing. They were to assist, stand there and watch, be on guard, so that nobody comes in and defiles the set apart place. Nobody runs and gets zapped, you know? We are told that the Luwites are to be separated from Israel because they have replaced the status and purpose of Israel's firstborns. So they are no longer a normal part of Israel anymore and will no longer be counted as such, which was the whole point of the census taken earlier of the Luites and also the firstborns of Israel. Of course, in terms of bloodline, the Luites remained a part of the Hebrew race and lived in Israel amongst the 12 tribes. But from this point on, they would no longer consider themselves Israelites and neither would Yehusha. Very important to remember this as we go on. They're not counted as one of the 12 tribes. And we dealt with that, uh, I think, in our last season, how for a, a week or so there was 14 tribes, probably longer than that. There was 14 tribes because Ephraim and Manasseh were added, and then uh, there was Yusuf as well, and then they replaced Yusuf, and uh, now the Luwites have been taken out and separated, so they're no longer counted. But Yusuf and uh, Louis are taken out, Ephraim and Manasseh are put in, so there's still 12. So, last episode of season two. We dealt with that, if you want to look at that. So, these rituals are not the same as what occurred in the establishing of Aaron and his sons, the priesthood, which involved being anointed with oil. So, Aaron and his sons had to be anointed with oil to have access into the set apart place. But this is a purification ritual and water is being used to cleanse the Luwites so that they would be clean enough to work around and near the sanctuary, assisting with the sacrifices at the brazen altar and maintaining the tabernacle. The priests were considered to be at a much higher level of set apartness than the common Luwites. So anybody, Aaron and his sons were considered much more set apart. They were anointed with oil allowed to go into the set-apart place. And of course, Aaron as the high priest went into the most set-apart place once a year. But the uh, common Luites, the three tribes, the three clans, I should say, the three clans of the Luites who were assisting, taking it down, putting it up, assisting with the sacrifices, you know, traveling, all that sort of thing, they were allowed to go into the tabernacle, the surrounds of it. And I want to finish today's portion by talking about redemption because this was fascinating particularly coming into the time of Passover as we are this week it's really important to understand these shadows the shadows of the feasts what Yahushua did 
so that you can actually step out of the shadows to Yahusha and not feel any guilt. Because that's what religion and these shadows and rituals, and everything that we do, we feel guilty, don't we? If we, because we have to be doing something. We have to be doing something. I, have to, I can't just not do any of the. I can't just not do any of the shadows. I feel dreadful. Part of my walk. It's what I, I love it. I could say the same thing about singing songs and playing the guitar back in the Christian church. I loved it, but it was all religion. It was all man. It's not where Yahusha was going. The same is with these feasts, guys. I'm going to harp on it a bit more later, but you've got to come out of the shadows. And that's why it's wonderful to know these shadows inside out so that you have a firm foundation in them. And then through that, you look at what Yahushua did, his sacrifice, and then you look today in the 21st century and go, it's all been done. How amazing is he? He's done all this for me so that I don't have to go through all that laborious work. Scripture reminds us that many times that redemption is a costly thing and can only be accomplished by a ransom being paid. Remember the whole checks and balances? A life for a life, a life for a disobedience. It had to all balance out to Yahushua, otherwise his set of partners would be compromised and he ain't compromising that for anybody because it's who he is. He's set apart. Scripture reminds us many times that redemption is a costly thing that can only be accomplished by a ransom being paid. So when Yahushua decided to redeem Israel from slavery in Egypt, the redemption price was the death of all the firstborns, all of them, all the firstborn had to be had to be killed. The firstborns of Israel and the firstborns of Egypt were included. Even the firstborn of animals, cattle and other livestock were included. And we've talked about why the firstborns were important. They were the high priests of the home. In all the uh, Middle Eastern cultures, not just Hebrews, they, the firstborns had the greatest esteem. In the, and it was where people believed their life force, their, they were going to live through their children even after they died. It was all, all sorts of superstitious stuff. But firstborns meant something in them. That's the main point. So it was, it was first, this was the price of deliverance. The death of the firstborns, Hebrews and Egyptians, and livestock and cattle. The slaughter of the firstborns was the ransom Yahushua required to redeem Israel from slavery. However, although Yahushua had laid his claim on all the firstborns, he decided he would not kill the firstborn of those households who trusted him by slaughtering a lamb and then painting the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes. So remember how I had those scales and everything had to balance from a few episodes ago? The Luwites had to be balanced with the firstborns. Everything has to balance. So for you who should say the firstborns have to die in order for this de deliverance to happen. In order for this deliverance to happen, the price is the death of the firstborns. All firstborns across the board. However, no matter what nation you're from, Anybody who sacrifices a lamb and puts it on the doorposts won't have to be sacrificed. That firstborn in that house, the firstborn's plural in that house, won't have to be killed. So if you want to keep the scales balanced, a lamb has to be sacrificed instead of you. You understand what I'm saying? There had to be death for this deliverance to occur. I hope I'm making any kind of sense here. Um, so he would not kill the firstborns of those households who trusted him by slaughtering a lamb and then painting the blood of that lamb on the doorposts of their homes. Those firstborns, both Hebrew and Egyptians, who sorry, those firstborns, both Hebrews and Egyptians, who trusted Yahushua by following his instructions concerning the first path of the lamb, were spared death. And those firstborns who did not trust him by applying the blood of the Passover lamb to their homes were killed. Of course, the vast majority of the Israelites, and probably a good number of the Egyptians as well, trusted the Elohim of Yisrael, resulting in their household firstborns being spared from Yahushua's wrath. wrath of. A lot of typos in this episode. Sorry, guys, I'll fix all those. On the other hand, the vast majority of Egyptians who did not trust Yahushua had their firstborns killed as a ransom. So... You understand that? In Proverbs it says, The wicked become a ransom for the obedient, 
and the evil for the upright. The wicked become a ransom for the obedient and the evil for the upright. And we're seeing that today. The wicked are being slaughtered all around us, aren't they? This virus is still going. So the biggest global pandemic in all of history. The wicked are becoming a ransom for the obedient and the evil for the upright. This event in Egypt was a perfect example of the wicked becoming a ransom for the obedient. And just because the firstborns of Israel had escaped Egypt did not mean their status had changed. Just because the firstborns of Israel had escaped Egypt did not mean their status had changed. The firstborn still remained Yahushua's set-apart property, meaning they owed a lifetime of service to him. However, Yahushua decided to substitute the tribe of Louis for the Yishraelite firstborns. And once that decision was made, the Yishraelite firstborns would no longer be obligated to serve Yahushua all their lives. That responsibility would fall on the Louites. Do you understand this? This whole idea of substitution and redemption for deliverance to occur blood had to be shed the blood of the firstborns was the price that had to be paid in order for Yahushua to balance his books because death just can't occur willy-nilly death had to occur for a reason and so in order for any firstborns to escape death that night blood had to be shed of an innocent animal an innocent lamb and so even then, when they went into the wilderness, the firstborn still belonged to Yahushua. Until this time here, after the golden calf, and we're still at that, we're still sitting at that time here. And Yahushua's saying, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna have the firstborns anymore, it's mine. I'm trading them in, trading them in for a new model. The Luwite tribe is now going to be mine to serve the tabernacle. Because if he hadn't done that, all the firstborns would be, would be the priests who would be serving at the tabernacle. But because of what they had done through the golden calf and the Luwites repenting, um, he's lifted up a new tribe now and separated them from Israel as the, as the priesthood, which is what we were just reading about, how to establish them. Redemption is not free. It requires a sacrifice. First, the lives of the firstborn Egyptians paid for Israel's redemption. Second, the Luwites were substituted for the firstborns. Now, Right here, the bulls are being taken to make atonement for the Luwites. What we are witnessing is a long chain of substitution being established. And who was the final end of this long chain of ransom payments? Yahushua himself. It is right here in the early scriptures that the principle, the pattern of redemption being accomplished by an authorized substitute to pay the ransom rightly owed to a perfectly set apart and just creator is established. So the whole principle of the fact that redemption had to be accomplished via an authorised substitute to pay the ransom rightly owed. This ransom was rightly owed because if there's disobedience, there's death. This is the ransom rightly owed to a perfectly set apart and just creator. And it's established right here. A ransom we are told Yahushua rightfully paid. So can you see it all... Everything we're going to study, that we have studied, that we will study, falls flat at the feet of Yahushua. He was this, if you could visualize it, as a tree almost. That all, he's just standing there and all these roots are going forth. All these shadows are going out from, from him in thousands and thousands of ways. Shadows we probably even haven't heard of or know about yet. But they're still shadows. We don't have to live them like they lived them there. The shadows have now been fulfilled through Yahushua, who lives within us. Through this interdimensional portal. Yes, I'm harping on the same terminology because people need to know this. The life. He is the vine, we are the branches. We don't have any life except through the root, through the portal, through him. That's where we get our fruit and right behavior from. He paid the ransom. He fulfilled all these scriptures through his own blood. And that's why it's so exciting. I'm not even finding this boring at all, going through all this, because coming at it from a 21st century mindset, I can see we're so privileged and blessed in these days to, to have all the answers to the riddles, so to speak. We know all the fulfillments, and the, the handful that haven't been fulfilled yet are going to be fulfilled soon, and we know what we're looking out for. 
we may not know the day or the hour, but we know the time and the seasons that, it's, that he's coming because he's revealed all his patterns. He makes known to his bride what he's going to do before he does it, you know? So then we have a blank page. That's all we have, guys. I haven't done this book up front this time. I'm doing it week, week in, week out and tying it in with... It's better for me that way because articles are coming in and Yahushua speaks. It's not such a big... You've got to do, you know, 200 odd pages all in one go and I want to get it out there while it's fresh. So I'm just doing a few pages at a time. That's why there's typos everywhere. But uh, it's really amazing. We're coming into the week of Passover now in a few days. And uh, look at that. What about the timing here? I was going to put the this uh, this episode off for a couple of weeks and just deal with all the Passover things. But when I got to the end of it, it's all about redemption and the next... Next episode, we're going to do two goes into the actual instructions for Passover as well. Goes into instructions for Passover. So I thought, what about the timing? And like I said, I hadn't even done the whole book in this one. I hadn't looked ahead because there's just so much stuff going on in our lives. It's busy. So, and Yahushua's timing is impeccable. So that's why I put out, I'm putting out this episode because it's smack bang on Passover. Time of Passover. So... Pay attention to the other episodes and culminations and compilations I'm putting out there because it's all to speak to the bride and say, look, my child, I've done all this for you. You don't have to labour in the wilderness of shadows. Dead shadows, actually. They are dead now because Yahushua's fulfilled them. So you've got to go on that journey with Yahushua through the shadows, get to Yahushua and then keep living with Yahushua. So if you're going on with Yahushua and you turn around and go back to the shadows, yeah, I'd go so far as to say they're dead, even though they're written in scripture. People who have built religions and traditions and, writ and you know liturgies around these shadows are dead. They're living in the deathly shallows, you know. It's dead, guys. It's time to come to life. Come into the life and relate, commune, communicate, have intimacy with the one great being who fulfilled he, he, the, the deity head found fulfillment in him. The fullness of all cosmic power of the creator of the universe is found in him. He's alive. He's 33 and a half years old in his flesh and he's alive and he's not up in some distant place somewhere he's right here the dimensions are connected on the throne of our hearts you know through that portal doorway so keep going guys and come out of the shadows particularly at this time of year don't go cleansing your house of all leaven be cleansing your vessel of leaven just as we're trying to do all day every day but particularly at passover We've found every year the, the pressure cooker gets turned up a bit at the time of Passover, where behaviours and the heat gets turned up and behaviours rise to the surface like gold. You've got to scrape it off, scrape off the dross, so that we can be purified. That's what Passover is about, who's turning up the heat. So if you're feeling the heat being turned up in your relationships, in your home, that's why it's Passover. We're cleansing out the leaven, not the physical leaven in the bread and the Vegemite and the, the flour and all that sort of stuff. Come on. Come out of all the childish tiddlywinks and it's about your vessel. Purging the, the leaven out so we can be married to a perfect being. And we have to be perfect and matured to be that. See us.